Today we are here with Professor David Duffy from the Botany Department, and you're going to talk to us a little bit about uh, biodiversity loss and climate change that you've studied. Well, Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> the thing I've been working on most recently uh, has been looking at the uh, South Pacific, the Oceanic Islands, and trying to figure out uh, what we can do about climate change. That's probably the place that's going to suffer most because of sea level rise. And there are many low islands that are basically going to go underwater and the people will have to move uh, or they'll have to uh, keep building their islands up. And uh, so what can we do for them in the next 50 years even? So I looked at uh, how we preserve biodiversity in the Pacific and whether this was a, a system that would work in the future with sea level rise. And also, some of the islands will become drier and some will become wetter. Uh, and those are things we know. They're things we don't know, uh, which may be worse, but we can't worry about them. And the tragedy, or the challenge, I guess, is that uh, we have the idea of Western parks. You draw a line, uh, and supposedly you protect everything inside of it, while um, outside, people can do whatever they want. And in the Pacific, uh, people have lived on the uh, water for tens of thousands of years probably <clears throat> and um, they've adjusted to a life where you treat the resources you use with uh, care and you have rules but you don't care much about the bio biodiversity you don't use. So a lot of the things that Western people value aren't important to uh, the islanders and for to have a park that's cut off from the islands doesn't make sense to them and thus it's not really respected. So the question was we're pouring millions of dollars into these parks. They're, most of them are not very efficient. Is there a way that uh, we can uh, use less money and be more efficient? So the research eventually centered on the realization that we would have to use traditional methods of managing and so encourage people to do what they're already doing which is to, to manage for the uh, resources they, they use. And then we just hope that all the other biodiversity piggybacks on, on their management. So basically the idea of big parks, unless you're gonna have guards at the boundaries and, uh, arrest, and arrest and annoy a lot of your neighbors, uh, isn't going to work in the future. Definitely. You know, I, I kind of laugh at that too, because you, know, you, you set up these boundaries but let's say the fish, are the fish not allowed to go out these, you know, it's, there's, they don't know anything about it. So it's kind of silly. And, you know, sometimes they're so small that they don't even do anything. Well, interestingly, a lot of places are using it, these uh, uh, exclosure areas, but they're ones that the community designs. Oh, okay. And so, for instance, in American Samoa, uh, out the national park is on the land, the uh, people have the sea, and one of the villages noticed that one of their main fish was disappearing. So they got together and said, we're gonna close this area for at least five years and see what happens. Uh, if the government of Samoa or the US had come in and said that, uh, people would have gone out and poached or just done what they were gonna do. Definitely, definitely. Now, how, what, what do you see as one of the main issues causing this? Why, I mean, obviously there's a lot of talk about sea, res sea, rev sea level rise and things like that, but what did you find that might be why we might be seeing some of these changes? Part of it is people. We, you know, The number of people is increasing, and uh, many of these systems there, the cultures that evolved, uh, did not have access to medicine, to Western medicine, and so there are many more people, and so there's more pressure on the resources. Throw on top of that, sea level rise, temperatures getting warmer, uh, cooking the coral. Another thing that's just recently in the last 10 years we realized is that the oceans are becoming more acidic and so there are a lot of uh, organisms such as coral <clears throat> that need, uh, can't stand these conditions because they need to accumulate carbon or argonite and so there's a danger over time that we will lose a lot of our reefs and a lot of the organisms like mollusks that have open shell systems and the water flows into them. Definitely. Do you see how, uh, you mentioned Western medicine and things like that, and, and you're right with the idea that if, if the government were to come in and lay these laws down, 
the people would not respect it. But culturally, they come together as a group and say, hey, we're losing something, one of our prized fish, we need to come together and sink it. Do you think it needs to be more at the community level with uh, all these ideas? Well, there's a sort of a paradox. Those communities, their, their expertise that across the Pacific where one island may have solved something, another island doesn't know about it. So we need to increase communication. And some of the islands also need resources. If they're going to close somewhere for 10 years, they're not going to have access to those fish. Uh, after that, they will have access. But in the meantime, what are they going to do? And so there's a trade-off between local initiatives and ideas versus the money which comes from outside. The trouble is a lot of the money never gets from D.C. to, say, one small village. Uh, it stops at the NGOs. Uh, it's, well, it stops at the government organizations. It stops at the NGOs. It stops in the capital of the city, uh, town of the country. And by the time you get to the little village, uh, there's much less money. Definitely. And then there's another problem that, uh, for instance, our government is all about accountability. But when you have a village of 20 people, there's no accountant. Uh, and so the governments get very worried that their money's being wasted and they, they require things that uh, local villages simply can't do. Yeah. What, what do you see um, as you mentioned, you know, they close it off for 10 years, but then they, they'll have it after that. What's the kind of ratio to the depletion rate to regrowth rate? How is that? It varies by fish. Uh, there are a lot of these areas uh, in the growing numbers in the U.S. and in uh, even Hawaii, but it depends on the fish. It would depend on what the pressure was uh, on, on the resource when you opened it up. At Waikiki, we have two preserves <coughs> that alternate uh, as to which ones are closed. But if a fisherman come in immediately after something's opened and just slam it, then the system doesn't really work very efficiently. The community has to decide after, when they're doing this, what's the level of fishing going to be once we're through. Now, you could close it for 50 years and maybe get enough fish so you could, everybody can fish as they want. But uh, with some of these large gropers uh, living for 50, 70 years, it's going to take a long time to recover. Right. So you kill one big female and that may be way more damage uh, than just messing around in the short term with immatures. Okay, so you're like, from what I'm getting, even if the money makes it from government to government, through all the stages, down to the community, the community implements these uh, laws and they stick with it, that it's, it's, there's multiple issues. Like, if it happens, even if that gets to that level where they can close this off and they have the resources to go somewhere else for that 10 years, they come back in and then if they don't lay down the law of how they want to fish it, uh, it's still gonna, it's just gonna be a circle. It's just gonna go back to where it was. Nope. And so what can they do, and you mentioned that they have to put the different laws in, but what else can they do to make sure that they, this doesn't just keep happening over and over? Well, these are not laws, they're uh, taboos or, yeah, okay. uh, or cultural limits. And so they're culturally respected, they're not legal at all. Uh, and so in a traditional society, uh, everybody knows, the small villages, everybody knows who's doing what. And they'll know if you're cheating. And also you're probably related to the person. And so you're stealing auntie's, cousin's, uncle's, third nephew's fish. <coughs> and uh, so you go home and you get whacked on the head by your grandmother. Uh, that's more powerful than a law unless there's someone to, to ensure the law is followed. Very true. What do you see as the, what, what's, what's so wrong with the loss of biodiversity? So can we just move from one fish to another? I mean, it, 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 to me, not to me, but mm. some people, I see it, but to some people, they would be like, ah, you know, we'll just move on to another fish once that's gone. Yeah, well, there's 500 fish in a village, uh, <coughs> but it, you kill certain ones. Uh, some of the big fish uh, crunch coral and make sand. <coughs> so over time, you're not gonna have any more sand. Uh, the fish you end up with may be fish that aren't as desirable uh, as what you've traditionally used. Uh, you're basically uh, rolling the dice as to what you'll get. 
Right. That's the practical side. Uh, from the, the, the Western biodiversity side, uh, basically we're losing uh, species, we're losing genetic information. We're just at a start of, of realizing there's a lot of genetic information out there that may be very useful. And we're ripping pages off a book and throwing them in the fire. And uh, so there's the Western perspective, both of, of use, the traditional sense of use, uh, and there's also the aesthetics. Uh, or the, uh, well, it's more Western, the, the idea of biodiversity being useful. Uh, you know, we're coming to an age now where communities don't, aren't the same, or they're all the same. Uh, and so we may live in a world where you have house sparrows, minas, uh, Bermuda grass, uh, two or three trees, and if that's okay, that's okay. Uh, but, uh, they may not, as I said, they may not be the ones you want, and uh, so you're going to have to live with them. Definitely, you know that's 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 another huge issue that people, some people are okay with that. Some people are okay with, you know, one tree is fine, you know, but in that sense, it, are we just letting nature take its course almost with dominant species and survival of the fittest, or are we? I know we're involved with it, but. Is that still, you know, we're all combined well, as one whole. People have to make that decision. Mm -hmm. and as a, the U.S., for instance, has said it's willing to put lots of money into protection, not as much as Ecuador or Costa Rica. Uh, we've put an awful lot of money into photogenic endangered species, but we're much less interested in the sort of the nuts and bolts, the insects uh, that make a forest work. Right. You know, I, I read a book about um, a gentleman who studied one tree and found 40 different species of ants, I believe it was, or mm -hmm. 400, but it was just an obscene amount just for one tree. And you mentioned, you know, we're just ripping pages out of a book and letting these people, letting these species go mm -hmm. away. And, you know, how, how can we figure out, because there's a, there's a difference between what we find in nature and what gets processed through the lab of how many species, there's a species sitting in, I don't want to say test tubes, but just sitting there waiting to get discovered. And that, that flow of work seems to be kind of bottlenecked. Yeah, um, I guess there are a couple of things there. An example of, of biodiversity we don't need um, is there are a lot of super species, tramp species, that go everywhere and can do tremendous damage. Uh, we had a tree here that uh, basically went extinct in the wild overnight because there was a gall wasp. Anytime a leaf popped up, the wasp would attack it. And uh, we were fortunate that one of the biologists went back to the home uh, country of the wasp. And because there was enough of it left, he, he found a couple of parasitoids that then went to work on, on the wasp itself. And so if you have super species and you don't have their environments, you may not have any way of controlling them in the future. Definitely, definitely. I mean, we have that issue here with quite a few different species, you know, mongoose, rats. Um, I actually just read in a newspaper how in Guam, the, the brown snake issue, mm -hmm. they are deciding to put mice that are laced with drugs into the wild to try to cut down on the brown snakes. And, you know, and at first glance you're like, oh, okay, you know, that's a solution. But what else is it going to, what other problems are, is it going to cause? You know, humans have a sense to not only make a problem, but they have a problem or an issue of making the problem worse. Well, in that case, it's the tree snakes came in and annihilated uh, all but one, I think, of the land birds, and the, that's bad enough. But if they get here, uh, we have cokey frogs and we have the little lizards, which are the perfect size for baby tree snakes, and they also uh, will attack children. There, uh, there are lots of cases in Guam of them trying to gnaw the hand of a baby. And so is this something we really, and they blow transformers. They yeah, love they to do. curl up. The heat, And yeah. blow them up. So there's the cost, there's the human cost. Uh, they eat, uh, some of them will eat small dogs, roosters. Uh, so it's a species we don't want. Uh, in that case, uh, the government spent millions and millions trying to find a way to control them. Uh, ideally to exterminate them. Uh, we don't know if that'll happen. It turns out they're uh, uh, allergic or they're, it's deadly poison, one of the relatives of aspirin. 
and I also eat dead things. So put a dead mouse together with an aspen, and uh, snakes snakes will eat it. And hopefully we can undo some of the damage uh, that's you know, started 60 years ago. Okay. Now, do you see that type of uh, solution going on in the smaller islands that you studied? Probably not because of the cost. Okay. There's an island of, you know, say, 17 people. Uh, do we really give a damn what's happening to it? No, we don't because we're not going to spend the money. The, probably those people will be forced to move. Uh, and if they're a culture that's been around 10,000 years, they're a language that's been around 10,000 years, they're moving to the mainland, they're moving into contact with other groups, there'll be strife but the kids are going to lose the language uh, and the culture. And there are 30,000 islands in the Pacific. I don't know how many of those actually have people on them, but even if it's a 1,000, uh, there's the loss in language and culture is going to be immense. Huge. And that should matter to, to people, but, uh, and it does, but effectively there's not much we can do. What about the people, are, are there people who won't move? who sea level rise and they're a group of 17 people and they're like, we've lived here all our life, we're not gonna move. Well, th I know there's, there's at least one island where that's happened, but it overwashes already now. The uh, taro fields, uh, ponds are becoming salty. And so, uh, you know, they may not wanna move, but if your house is, there's water running through your living room and you have nothing to eat uh, and that destroys the water supply. Back in 1983, uh, we believe people died of thirst on some of the islands uh, because there was no rainfall and some of the islands had so little fresh water to begin with. And so if this happens in the future, that was during an El Nino, a climate aberration. Uh, if it gets drier, happens during an El Nino, uh, what are we gonna do? You either move the people um, or bad things happen. Mm -hmm. In 83, uh, it, there's some of these islands, boats only come two or three times a year. And so if they're running out of water, it's a long time to wait. Yeah. Uh, how do you see that relating to possible things that might happen here on the Hawaiian Islands? Well, we're supposed to get less windy, which will probably mean less water in the mountains. Uh, we will also, it also means we'll get hotter. Uh, sea level rise is not really a problem, well it already is a problem, uh, but there's been a neat study here uh, by a guy named Fletcher that you don't just go to the shore and measure sea level rise, it's the sea will come up well inland. So behind Wa Waikiki is going to turn to Venice eventually, but behind that, the golf course, things like that, uh, will start flooding. And that's going to happen, uh, and in, unless we start planning now uh, as to rearranging, uh, creating water, uh, places that water can uh, accumulate instead of your backyard. Right. Do you see any uh, progress in implementing those types of? Uh, not here. <laughs> uh, they're still talking about it. New York, for instance, is thinking about doing uh, some of those massive water defenses that uh, the Dutch have to close their harbor. But some of these things, need to be thought through better because if you close the barrier uh, under the goal, no, under the, was it the Staten Island Bridge, uh, that means the water has to go somewhere so it'll just go over Long Island. And so one of the things we can do here, uh, we can, for instance, the Kamehameha Highway, the airport, uh, some of those have problems right now. Uh, can we start moving the Kamehameha um, Highway inland? It's going to cost billions of dollars, but if we wait until it's uh, underwater, it'll cost more. <laughs> the airport, are we going to build it up, uh, or are we going to go and, and uh, use uh, the Army runway in the center of the islands? So those are the sort of decisions we should be thinking about. Uh, our buildings, one of the ones we learned from New Orleans is, where is your generator? A lot of generators are on the ground floor, actually uh, the nuclear power plants in Japan. The generators were on the uh, ground floor. That's not a good place to have them when you have flooding. Mm -hmm. So individuals may, uh, all these beautiful, expensive beach houses, uh, are we gonna buy them out uh, or stop giving them flood insurance 
and uh, gradually abandoned a lot of that land to the sea. Uh, you know, we, maybe we should be telling people, in 20 years, we will know, you will no longer have U.S. flood insurance. Your property is you know, now in the- High hazard zone, yeah. yeah. So there are things you can do and to make it easier, uh, but if you wait till it's too late or, or very late, uh, then you have a, it's more costly and you may not have a chance to plan it right. Now, and you mentioned New York. So Hawaii, in comparison to the rest of the mainland, would you say is a little behind? Some of them are, well, I don't know how, quite how to answer that. You know, Florida has a problem. It's going to be a couple of islands. It's going to be sort of Key West going all the way up to the Georgia border. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little, but uh, there's some cases, how can you plan about that? Uh, we're luckier because we're higher. And that's the difference between, say, well, us in Morea, Tahiti are high. Uh, the island Tuvalu uh, is five meters high and in a, in a good tide. And so they probably can't do much. Uh, what we can do here, we need to, to think about and start planning and start doing. Definitely. Is there anything that you'd like to add about how? Uh... Well, one of the things is everybody, if you look at it, it's sort of hopeless. Uh, and you know that we're not going to stop emitting carbon. We're not going to go back to uh, raising uh, kalo and not having automobiles. Uh, and the Chinese are going to uh, increase the quality of their lifestyle. So in terms of carbon and, and warming, it's going to continue. But there's a lot in terms of biodiversity that we can do. Uh, there are corals. We may not be able to save all the corals or the coral reefs. Perhaps we need to look into some that to already tolerate high temperatures. Uh, we need to look into uh, what are the species that maybe th thrive under more acidic conditions. Uh, we need to start uh, getting more serious about uh, working with local peoples, but also uh, in the United States, thinking about parks. Right now they're fine, but if you have animals, plants that need to migrate uh, northward, uh, presuming it's colder uh, or wetter, uh, do we have, do we need to reconstruct the parks so they can move, or do we need to think about which ones we want to move? So there's a lot to be done. It's not hopeless. Uh, it's certainly not hopeless here, but you need to plan and you need to uh, get people to think. I agree, and you know, it's it's not one issue. It's multiple issues, and they all. Mm -hmm correlate with each other. So uh, I'd like to say thank you for talking with us today and uh, I appreciate you spending the time. My pleasure. Great.